When I was young, my father and I found an old treehouse in the woods. Even though it was left alone for many years, it was still in great shape. It wasn't a simple box in a tree. It connected to three different trees with raised wooden paths and multiple floors. One of the trees even had a pulley system that would act as an elevator, allowing us to bring heavy items up into the tree. When we found it, my father and I agreed this was going to be our summer project to fix it up. There were a few boards that needed replacing. The old rope ladder needed to be replaced as well, but the wooden ladder leading up into the treehouse still worked well. And after just a few weekends, it was back in shape and had a fresh coating of paint. Our only clue on who built it was a carving in the biggest tree. Mark Pierce. Mark with a C. But even after we finished fixing it, we still added more to the treehouse. At the time, I was really into electronics, and my dad wanted me to enjoy the treehouse fully. So we weatherproofed the treehouse and even set up a solar collector and a battery so that I could have lights, a civilian band radio, and even let me charge my phone. I still remember that look in my father's face when I soldered the last wire and asked my dad to plug in his phone. Both their faces lit up when they saw that his phone was charging. We camped out a few times in the treehouse, so during the last weekend of summer, my father gave permission for me to go camping in the treehouse with my friend from school. Charlie, a quiet but kind boy. We were about a 30-minute trek from my house, and we had enough food and water to last the entire weekend, plus a few extra days, just in case. My father always told me to bring extra food in case an emergency happened, but it was supposed to be a simple and fun camping trip, just Charlie and I. Friday was great. We built a fort in the woods, built out of stones and leftover lumber and logs. It didn't really serve any purpose, but it was fun to build with Charlie. When the sun set, we were in our sleeping bags and told scary stories around the lantern. A campfire in the wooden treehouse felt like a terrible idea, and I promised my father I wouldn't play with matches this weekend. Charlie told me a story about how years ago, the town we lived in didn't have graveyards, and how they would take their dead out into the woods to feed giant scavengers known as harvest men. And although the town eventually thought they, all the harvest men had starved to death, rumors said that a few starving harvest men still existed in the woods, seeking out anyone who dared wander these woods. While that story was certainly unsettling, I had my own story to tell Charlie. Charlie's glasses glinted in the light of the electric lantern as I sat up, letting the shadows cast behind me as I told a story that my father told me many times. According to him, it was what happened to my mother, a story I felt was perfect to tell in the situation. Once, a long time ago, there was a scientist who studied the hidden forces of the universe known as dark energy and dark matter. Her discoveries were celebrated in her field, but still the scientist felt there was greater potential than even what she found so far. So the scientist went deeper and deeper into her darker and darker studies. She discovered ripples in the fabric of the universe, generated from supermassive black holes. And in her mind, she saw a pattern that no one else saw. Still, she went deeper still, trying to decode what these patterns said. So, she consulted occult works that told of a pattern and a resonance that sung from the void between the stars. So, the scientist turned her study from the pattern emitted from supermassive black holes 
to examining the patterns from void space, where there were no stars, no planets, no matter of any kind to create radio signals. But it was in this void that the scientist found the resonance she was looking for. What it told her was terrible. The resonance told of worlds dying from their own arrogance, of stars that burned until they froze, of black moons howling and of silver moons singing. But the scientist still dug deeper and deeper. The woman discovered beneath it all was a powerful being unlike any other she had dreamt of. A being of many eyes, many wings, and no face. The one who lies in shadows. A being of such great power that all dark matter and energy was its song throughout the universe. The woman, having seen the eldritch entity, was taken to a prison beyond the stars, along with the person she loved the most in all of the universe, her daughter. In that timeless void, the scientist sat with her daughter who never aged, and though she never ate nor drank, even death couldn't visit them in that void. But in those sunless lands, the scientist continued to learn. She learned how to sing her own songs, and to sing them in a way to imprison the one who lies in shadows. But after imprisoning the one who lies in shadows, she learned that she couldn't bring herself back to Earth. There always had to be someone to sit on the throne of shade. So the scientist took that place and brought her daughter back to Earth. The woman, having spent so much time in the void, she lost her name. So she now called herself the Lady of Shadows. And now she's the one who sings a song to keep the one who lies in shadow confined, and she still seeks to understand what lies beyond the universe. I finished my story, and Charlie waited in silence. Before he asked the same question, I asked my father the first time I heard that story. What happened to the daughter? Charlie asked me. Well, you see, Charlie, the daughter was found resting in her bed, holding onto the story to give to her father. The little girl grew up to be happy and normal, despite her extraordinary circumstances. Her father eventually moved past his gone wife and married a loving man, and the young girl had two dads now, and a mother who lived beyond the stars. I finished, pointing to the stars like I was pointing out where the Lady of Shadows lived. And that little girl's name is Genevieve, I told Charlie as I turned down the light, which would cause it to slowly dim and turn off. Isn't your name Genevieve? Charlie asked. I only nodded as I let the last of the light fade. Not long afterwards, Charlie fell asleep and I gazed up at the stars while leaning on the window sill. Father told me that story many times and swore that it was true. I looked up at the stars and thought about my mother. I never knew her and we didn't even have pictures of her. Father said they all burned the day I vanished. And I was returned, just as mysteriously the next day, clutching a folded envelope with that story. Whether I believe it or not, I'm not sure. When I was young, I never believed in Old Man Winter, but one night, just before Saturnalia, I saw beyond my window a figure dressed in blue, riding a skeletal horse, just like in the stories my dad told me. So, at ten years old, I believed in Old Man Winter, when most of my peers had given up a long time ago. And now, here I was, looking up at the stars, not sure if I believed that my mother was in space, 
or if she was just an another absentee mother. But as I looked up in the heavens, I was reminded of a line that I learned in school. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. I reminded myself, the world is a vast and mysterious place, even bigger than my beliefs. So surely there was room in my beliefs for a mother that loved me and was confined beyond the stars. Satisfied with this, I was about to tuck myself in when the radio squawked. June bug, come in. This is Papa Bear. I have something urgent to tell you. Over. I crawled over to the radio and pressed the button down. Papa Bear, this is June bug. What is it? Over. I responded. Even though it was only supposed to be us on this frequency, Father wanted me to treat it seriously. So I had to practice. Hence the call names and the over to indicate wanting a response. Something happened in town, a bit of a biohazard situation. We're hoping it doesn't get bad, but it'll be safer for both you and Charlie to remain in the treehouse until either I get you or Big Bad does. Over, my father said. Big Bad was the call name for his husband and my dad, Rex. Still, though, father was known for jokes, but this didn't feel like a joke. Is it a flying pig situation? Over. I responded, remaining hopeful that it was an easy problem to fix. Or at least one that we were prepared for. But the silence from the radio spoke volumes before he spoke again. Is it the mask of the Red Death? I asked a tremor in my voice, and I forgot to say over. Affirmative. Over, my father said in a calm voice. Does the black moon howl? I asked him. A phrase he learned from his younger days, and one we used to indicate if something was or wasn't serious. Only when her face is revealed, my father responded. This was serious and would very quickly escalate. So I was going to have to tell Charlie in the morning. I will contact you when I can. Out. My father said as the radio went dead, and I was left al with alone with a sleeping Charlie next to me and my mother far above. I don't know when I fell asleep, but when I woke up, Charlie was gone. His sleeping bag was empty and no indication about where he went. I felt my heart tense as I saw the rope ladder was deployed to the ground. Charlie left the treehouse and was now on the ground. Now worried, I felt conflicted. My father told me not to leave the treehouse until he got here. But my friend was on the ground, not aware of the masquerade of the dread death back in Shepherd. If I left him there, he may get hurt. But if I went after him, then I might get hurt. I looked at the ladder leading down as I made my decision. I quickly and quietly climbed down the ladder, and when I made it to the ground, I crept along as quietly as I could, whispering Charlie's name as I tried to find out where he went. All of a sudden, the sound of crunching leaves and snapping sticks were heard, and when I stood on them, everything stuck out a lot to me. I knew that they were attracted by noise, but I had another advantage. As long as I could hear wildlife, I knew that they weren't nearby. They scared animals away. I crept to where our agreed-on bathroom ditch was. Normally, the idea of interrupting my friend's business grossed me out, but this was a situation where life and death were in question, 
So that took priority. And while I made my way to the ditch, I heard rustling coming from the direction of the ditch. I crouched next to the trunk of a nearby tree and listened closely. I could hear birds singing as the rustling got closer and closer. I stayed crouched and waited as the rustling continued to get closer. A short figure stepped through the brush and I let myself breathe again when I saw that it was Charlie. He loudly stomped through the woods as I stood up and tapped his shoulder. La la la, he said as he turned to face me. What are you doing? We need to get back to the treehouse. Quickly and quietly, I told him. He stared at me like I was crazy, but then he mimed gluing his mouth shut. Thankfully, Charlie was listening as we carefully made our way through the forest to the treehouse. As we got close, though, the forest went silent, and I grabbed Charlie's shoulder. I pointed at the ground and lifted a finger to my lips to indicate that we were to crouch down, but also remain silent. And sure enough, Charlie understood what I was saying as we both crouched down and remained quiet. We stayed still and silent as we waited. We didn't have to wait long. It was dragging its left foot on the ground while it shambled down the trail. The white gown it wore was stained brown and red. The hem of its gown was torn and full of holes from being dragged through the woods. The tips of its fingers had the gleam of bone that shone through its wounds, but there was no blood and no coagulation, just the strips of gray flesh and bone that reflected the early morning sunlight. Its chest had a massive bite that looked like it was taken out by a wild animal. The wound didn't bleed, and delicate ribs could be seen, but so could its lung, deflated and still, even as the abomination continued its morbid march through the forest. But its face was the most terrifying part. The lips were chewed through, giving it a never-ending smile, and the teeth were still coated in fresh blood. Above the teeth were the remnants of a face mask used for cleaning pores, also splattered with blood, but the eyes were dull and bloodshot. The hair was long and tangled, full of clotted blood and leaves. Just a day or two ago, I would have recognized the figure as my teacher, Miss Rebecca. But now, I could only keep thinking of the words, Mask of the Red Death. Thankfully, the sufferer didn't see us as it continued its shamble down the trail. I remembered a piece of advice from my father. When people didn't have any goals in mind, they usually went downhill because it was the easiest way to walk. I guess that applies to sufferers of Samd syndrome too. We waited in silence for five minutes before we moved again and made it to the treehouse. Thankfully, without seeing any other sufferers, we made it to the ladder and climbed up into the treehouse. When up in the treehouse, Charlie finally asked, What in Hella's name was that? A sufferer of Samd syndrome. What does Saturday have to do with anything? Samd syndrome is a bacterial infection that is transferred by either bites or blood. It causes the brain to swell and shuts down all of your organs. But the bacteria doesn't let you die, even as your organs shut down. It will keep your body biting and moving around 
looking for others to infect. They will use uh, any senses that remain functional, but are primarily attracted by sound, including sound made by other sufferers. The only way to stop them is to severely damage the brain or completely destroy the body. They will also vomit the remnants of their victims if they get close, so don't get close. My father contacted me by radio last night. He told me that he's coming to get us, but we're going to have to stay quiet and stay high up. Any luck? We'll never even know that where we are. Charlie took out his phone and whispered, I have to call my parents. They need to know. I covered his phone with my hand. Please, you can text them, but please do not call them. The noise will attract more. The very fact we already saw one means that there's more out in the forest. They're like an infection. What you see is only the very top of a much more precarious problem. And if they are in the woods, I don't know how much of Shepard has been overrun. I said, but then I saw Charlie was getting scared of what I said. So I tried to switch to something more positive. Well, it'll be over soon. Most outbreaks of Sandy syndrome don't even last a full 24 hours. I told him, which brought some color back to his face. But I omitted the fact that most outbreaks of SAMD syndrome ended after 24 hours because they consumed all humans in their area by then. But I had to remain hopeful and wait for my father's call on the radio. We had a quiet breakfast of granola bars and lemonade while we waited for our parents to respond. Charlie didn't get any response to his texts, nor any notification that his texts were even read. Charlie was clearly getting more and more anxious as time went on, so he tried watching Share My Dave's videos wearing his headphones so no noise escaped. Normally, I would comment about conserving battery life while camping, but the treehouse had solar chargers and the sun was still up. And honestly, one of my survival guides, provided by my father, stressed the importance of staying entertained during outbreaks like these. The book stressed that hopelessness and helplessness would drive even well-protected and well-supplied survivors into dangerous situations. And as anyone who has survived a pandemic could tell you, boredom and paranoia go hand in hand. I spent the time checking geotags on Share My Day. A truly heinous amount of people in Shepherd put geotags on their social media and would have their location announced every hour. I don't see the appeal. But thankfully, it gave me an advantage. It would mean that their locations would be updated each hour, and most people who died would die with their phones still on them. The geotags weren't as helpful as I thought. Most people were still in their homes, but I also saw a group of 20 classmates in the school. Considering both yesterday and today was the weekend, that didn't bode well. Still, watching the dots move slowly on the map and slowly spread across Shepherd, I almost didn't notice the soft squawk of the radio. Junebug, this is big bad. Just letting you know we're on our way, but we have run into complications. Over, my dad said over the radio. I picked up the receiver and pressed the button. Mrs. Junebug, what kind of complications? Over, I asked. The radio squawked again as I heard my dad yelling in the background. Sharon, we talked about this. 
I would rather kill you than let you into my home. But there's zombies behind me. Then get behind me, you bitch. My dad then responded to me in a much calmer tone. Uh, just a bit of a detour, but we will be there soon. Is Charlie with you? Over. I looked over at Charlie, who was still watching videos without noticing that I was on the radio. Yes, he's with me. What's wrong? Over, I responded. There was silence over on the other end. I'm so sorry, kid, but Oliver's father didn't make it. And it is with a heavier heart that I say that Sharon is still alive. We will try to be there in about 45 minutes, but please try not to tell him. We will break the news to him when we get there. But kiddo, be careful. You know how that changes you. Over. Why are you telling me first? Over. I asked, not sure what to do with this information, nor how to keep it a secret from Charlie. Charlie is going to need his friend more than ever when the crisis is over. And it's better that you understand in case we get delayed more. Over. That last part wasn't said out loud, and I was glad he didn't say it out loud. As long as it wasn't said out loud, it stayed hypothetical. But if it was said out loud, then it became a possibility. And if it was a possibility, then I would be anxious about it. It was a small act, but one I appreciate my dad doing for me. I understand, Big Bad. I love you, and please tell Papa Bear that I love him too, I said, my voice breaking up from too much to say. Over. Saying over felt more final than it normally did. Thankfully, my dad didn't correct me. I will, and just know that we love you too. Out, he said, as his side went silent, as I laid down on the wood and looked up at the wooden ceiling of the treehouse. I just let my emotions fill me up and then drain slowly. There wouldn't be a lot of time to process all of them, but that didn't mean I wasn't feeling them. Something deep inside of me wanted me to keep going, to be strong not just for myself, but for my friend Charlie. I turned to look at him. He lost someone he loved and cared about, and he wasn't even aware. All he was focused on was the video in front of him, and even knowing that there were sufferers stalking through Shepard, he was living, not just surviving. And I still had two parents, even if I was missing my mother. So, I wouldn't just survive. I would live. I sat up and crawled over to Charlie. What are you watching? I asked as he showed me a video of Hush doing a video game dance to fundraise for charity. He offered me an earbud, and I listened to pop music while watching the 80-foot woman try to do a four-step routine. We watched videos for hours and soon fell asleep watching them. I woke up partially when I heard creaking on the ladder. But before I had a chance to feel afraid, I heard my father's voice. Genevieve, are you there? I lifted an arm and he crawled over to where Charlie and I rested. I'm not sure how, but he got me and Charlie down as I faded in and out of sleep, not sure what was or wasn't a dream. I recognized the warmth of the car and my seat belt as I was buckled in while father drove us somewhere that wasn't home. As I faded off to sleep, I heard my father whisper to my dad. I was so worried. 
She's a brave girl, and I knew she would listen, but I'm still worried. My dad reached across to gently rest his hand on my father's shoulder. I was worried too, but honey, we made it, and she made it. She knows enough, but we managed to spare her from the worst. We should be glad about that. She didn't just survive. It looks like she had a great time. Isn't that the goal of every parent? That their kids aren't just safe, but happy, even during the hard times? I faded off to the darkness before my father responded. Just glad to be safe with my dads and my friend Charlie. If there were sounds of splashing liquid and no sound of rain, well, I could keep my eyes closed and keep it hypothetical, trusting my dads to keep me in the safe place.